Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Chris Paulson, the Tykeson Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Oregon. He is also a climate scientist and a professor of earth science. Dean Paulson's research seeks to understand the causes of past climate change on Earth and what lessons they hold for predicting our future climate. Much of his work uses advanced theoretical climate models as tools for exploring climate processes and dynamics. To do this work, he collaborates closely with geologists, environmental scientists, and ecologists. He has co-authored over 130 articles on topics such as past cold and warm climates, climate mountain interactions, and earth system modeling. Paulson is an associate editor at the American Journal of Science, and he's a fellow of the Geological Society of America and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Before coming to the U of O in 2022, Paulson was the Associate Dean for Natural Sciences in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts at the University of Michigan from 2018 to 2022. He served as Chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Michigan from 2014 to 2018, and its Associate Chair for Graduate Studies from 2010 to 2014, among other administrative roles. At the University of Michigan, he received the John Dewey Award for Excellence in Teaching and was the Henry N. Pollock Collegiate Professor. Thank you, Chris, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So first, let's talk about your research, your, your identity as a scholar. Tell us a bit about your background and what sparked your interest in earth sciences and climate change. Sure. Well, um, I grew up in um, southwest Montana, uh, outside of Helena, Montana. Uh, I like to, to tell people that we had uh, three uh, television stations at that time. Two of them were the same. So my, my brother and I uh, spent our time entertaining ourselves, running around uh, the, the hills ar around our house. Uh, once I graduated from high school, I went on to a liberal arts college, Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. I went there thinking that I was going to be a major in either physics or philosophy. I guess I was interested in abstract ideas uh, back then. Uh, but like liberal arts colleges do, uh, I had an opportunity uh, to, to, to discover and explore and uh, found my true um, interest uh, was in earth sciences uh, and uh, geology. And I, I attribute uh, that interest to my, my childhood and growing up and uh, being uh, in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. Well, you're in a good place for that. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so tell us what, our, what paleoclimates are and how does the study of them help us understand anthropogenic climate change today? Great question. So paleoclimatology or paleoclimates are the study of past climates. And that's both the description or understanding of what the climate state was like back then uh, and also the cause of uh, that past climate. The, the fascinating thing about um, Earth history is it has a really rich climate history. And that climate history uh, includes extreme cold periods uh, and extreme warm um, periods. An extreme cold period, for example, was 18,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum, when there is uh, about a, a mile thick uh, ice sheet above um, or on, in northern North America and northern uh, Eurasia. And then there's been extreme warm climates uh, like the Eocene, where there was uh, no permanent ice on uh, the poles. And the fauna and flora were uh, tropical uh, types of uh, species. So what paleoclimate offers is it offers uh, a description and understanding of the range of possible climate states on Earth. This is really important as we think about anthropogenic climate change because our historic period, uh, we have been through, a, has a, a very narrow climate history. There's not a lot of range there because we've been within uh, a small uh, CO2 window. So if we want to understand what the future was going to be, what the future climate state is going to be, we have to look to past climates to understand that. Right now, uh, the atmosphere has 415 ppm of carbon dioxide. Uh, that's quite an increase over when uh, you and I uh, uh, were children. But the last time the levels were that high were in the Pliocene, which is three to five million years ago. Hmm. <laughs> that seems ominous to me. Um, so what, what, what's the data that you collect to find out about what climates were like? Yeah, good question. I didn't bring my uh, paleoclimate proxy lecture. Uh, I probably should have, and, and I could uh, go on for at least an hour on this topic. Uh, but uh, briefly, uh, let me tell you that the, the climate evidence that we use really uh, changes with the time period of interest. And so if we're interested in uh, more recent climates, 
uh, more recent than the last million years. Then we have ice core cores we can look at, tree ring uh, records, as well as um, sediment cores from uh, lakes and um, oceans. If we go back beyond a million years, we don't have, there is no uh, ice left and it's hard to find uh, tree rings. So then uh, all the evidence comes from sediment cores, uh, and mostly fossils in those sediment cores or outcrops on uh, land. And so paleoclimatologists have these, have figured out really clever geochemical methods to use the sediments and the fossils in this, those sediments to derive uh, estimates of past temperature and past carbon dioxide concentrations. So uh, that's all well and good. I don't do any of that work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I use that uh, data uh, to compare with simulations, but most of my work is using uh, complex Earth system models, the same ones that we use to project uh, future climate. Uh, and, and I use those models to try and simulate past uh, climates, like past warm uh, states, mm -hmm. to see if the models can accurately do that. And that's really important because if, we, if they can't simulate a past warm climate, then we can't have faith that they'll simulate a future warm climate. And have they succeeded in sim yeah. simulating uh, past that, ones? <laughs> that is a fantastic uh, question. So I've been doing this for some time, and uh, the answer uh, has been no, 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 no. Wow. But recently, um, we have had great success, and it has to do with how they've changed uh, some of uh, the physical uh, processes within the models. But more recently, uh, we uh, demonstrated that uh, one of the NCAR models did, actually did a really good job of simulating that Eocene climate. Huh, fascinating. Can you say what some of these historical causes of climate variations have been? Yeah, again, I didn't bring my climate change uh, <laughs> lecture and I could go on for an hour. So I'm, I'm just, I'm going to go right to the main point here, which is if you look over Earth history and what is the cause of uh, climate, it's predominantly carbon dioxide concentrations. When carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are high, we have warm climates. When carbon dioxide levels are low, we have cold climates, uh, glaciers and ice sheets um, expand. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that the, even though carbon dioxide was, has controlled uh, climate through Earth history, what we're doing now is we're accelerating that. And so the rate at which we're increasing uh, CO2 is uh, orders of magnitude faster than in the past. In the past, carbon dioxide was really controlled by volcanism and outgassing of carbon dioxide, as well as se sequestration of that carbon dioxide when mountains were built mm. and uh, were weathered or when um, organic matter was buried. We're essentially taking that fossil organic matter, burning it in our cars and factories, and accelerating uh, CO2 rise very quickly. Thank you for that, it's very helpful. Um, so let's talk about the other hat that you wear as okay. the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. So first, what attracted you to the College of Arts and Sciences? Let me start by saying uh, how fortunate I feel to be the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I was attracted by the fact that CAS is a liberal arts college with one of the, within one of the nation's premier uh, research institutions. This is a, a special and rare combination uh, we have the, the opportunity uh, to educate uh, students and provide them a transformative uh, education that prepares them for a life of purpose. And then our faculty and staff are conducting research that has a positive imp impact uh, and, and frankly is, is just plain fascinating. <laughs> um, so it's the ability to support and grow this mission, this mission uh, which was one of the, the most important factors. The other thing is I, I came and I interviewed at the University of Oregon, uh, met people. What I realized is how much they care about this institution. It was clear from talking with them uh, what a special place the University of Oregon is. And then of course Eugene is in the Pacific Northwest, has fabulous uh, natural uh, beauty, outdoor activities, and that was uh, really frosting on the cake. So you have mentioned that CAS is the Liberal Arts College at the University of Oregon, and as you also know that the University of Oregon, within the model of state institutions, is the Liberal Arts University. You went to Carleton College, one of the great liberal arts uh, colleges in the country. I went to also a great liberal arts college, so you and I share this commitment and this belief in liberal arts. But say a little bit more about why liberal arts is so important. Great question. 
Um, I think it's, it comes down to the purpose of a college education. In, in my view, the purpose of a college education is to prepare our students for a life of purpose. And that includes uh, ha having them uh, feel uh, success uh, about personal um, s success as well as contributing uh, to society in their roles as uh, citizens, workers, uh, and uh, leaders. A liberal arts education prepares them for that. First and foremost, in following my own experience, it allows students to uh, pursue their interests and find their passions. It also provides them a, a depth uh, and breadth of both knowledge and experience. Um, and we also know that it provides transferable skills that employers are looking for. Those include communication skills, analytical and quantitative skills, as well as understanding, uh, empathy, compassion, ability um, to consider uh, multiple uh, perspectives. Uh, these are all transferable skills that can't be uh, replaced by a robot or artificial intelligence. Uh, the other thing that a liberal arts college does is it is exposes um, students to complexity, diversity, uh, and change. And that's really important. Uh, we know that uh, the average U.S. worker uh, will change their job 12 times throughout their, um, their lifetime of, of careers. So our students need to be flexible and adaptable, and a liberal arts education provides them transferable skills that allow them to do that. So I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities mm -hmm. Center. I'm an English professor. Obviously, um, I have a particular interest in the role of the humanities in the liberal arts college. So say a little bit about your understanding about the, why the humanities is a crucial part of this liberal arts mission. Yeah. First, I just want to underscore that the humanities are essential to a, the liberal arts uh, mission. You know, they're, they're one leg of this three-legged stool, which includes the natural sciences uh, and the social sciences. Paul, you and I are human. <laughs> the humanities explore what it means uh, to be a human, uh, and they address the most uh, pressing questions that our society uh, faces. Uh, questions around identity of gender uh, and uh, race, around culture, around social justice, uh, around um, ethics. Uh, they ask questions like, who are we? What do we care about? Why are we, what are our differences and why are our differences uh, important? The other thing that the humanities do and humanities courses do is they provide our students with both cognitive and um, um, non-cognitive um, skills. You know, the cog cognitive skills I've mentioned a little bit before, they include analytical skills, communication skills, uh, the ability to construct an evidence-based um, argument. The non-cognitive skills are the empathy, uh, understanding, th this ability to think of, uh, of multiple perspectives at once. All our students need those skills. Not just, uh, not just the ones that are humanities uh, majors. Not only that, these skills are important, not just for future climate scientists and doctors, but they're also critical, but also for uh, future teachers um, and lawyers. So you just mentioned climate scientists and doctors. Tell us a little bit about how um, research in the College of Arts and Sciences and teaching in the College of Arts and Sciences is uh, uh, responding to the, the challenges of climate change. Yeah, good, good question. We have a lot of uh, faculty and um, students who are focusing on some aspects of uh, climate change uh, in their um, studies. I'm going to give you, uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to give you th um, three uh, examples of work that's being done in, in um, CAS by our faculty and students. And the first example is Mark Carey's lab. Uh, his lab investigates uh, the impact of glacier melting. Uh, and he has a new grant that's looking at glacier melting in Greenland and its effect on fjords, marine ecosystems, and Greenland um, communities. Another example is the Oregon um, Hazards uh, Lab, or OHAS. Um, OHAS, as you know, has a monitoring uh, system, a resilience monitoring system. Uh, one of the things they monitor is climate change uh, and its effect on um, uh, natural systems. They're specifically focused on detection of forest fires and also the impact of wildfires on natural systems. And then the final example I'm, I'm going to give is of Lucas Silva and the work that he and his colleagues are doing. They again just received a, a very large a grant to work with um, indigenous and rural communities to find ways of sequestering or sucking carbon dioxide uh, out, of the, out of the atmosphere in ways that are both respectful and engage um, indigenous uh, populations. Oh, 
that's fascinating stuff. I know those, I know those projects, yeah. and they're all amazing. Um, at the University of Michigan, you demonstrated deep commitment to addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I know that that was something that was one of the things that attracted the, in, the, the University of Oregon to you as a candidate. Can you give us an update on the efforts CAS is making to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility? I'm happy to, and I, I would just start by saying that uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility uh, remain priorities of, of mine, and they remain priorities in CAS. Uh, our goal is to create an environment in CAS where all faculty, students, um, and staff feel like they belong and can do their very uh, best work. Uh, for the last several years, um, CAS uh, has been implementing inclusive teaching strategies uh, uh, in order to increase accessibility and inclusion uh, in classrooms and to reduce the equity gap among grades. Uh, they've also been uh, implementing uh, recruiting, uh, inclusive recruiting uh, practices so that we get the, the most diverse candidate pools uh, that we possibly can. Uh, in the last year, we specifically did two things. Uh, one is I created a leadership position, the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, I then appointed Nadia Singh, Professor in Biology, uh, to that role. Uh, and I did that so that we would have someone focusing uh, specifically on those uh, issues in CAS uh, and the ability for that person uh, to coordinate with both um, central efforts and departmental efforts. Um, the second thing that we uh, did in the last year is we uh, supported and improved a Latinx faculty cluster hire. Uh, and that um, hire will bring six tenure track faculty members uh, in, the, from this, in the social sciences and humanities uh, to uh, the university and will, of course, diversify uh, not only our faculty but our um, curriculum. As I look forward, you know, what are we going to do next? Uh, in the next uh, year specifically, we're going to be focused on faculty mentoring and providing um, excellent mentoring as, to both our associate and, and uh, assistant professors. And then we're working on uh, trying, uh, on working on creating a climate in CAS uh, where there's community and uh, belonging. Uh, so that's where we're headed. All very worthwhile and interesting initiatives. I hope they are successful. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned the appointment of Nadia Singh. Um, you've actually recently announced several new appointments in mm -hmm. the dean's office, three of which I think are entirely new positions, including Nadia's position. Tell us about all of them and um, especially why you created these three yeah. new associate dean positions. Uh, great question. Uh, I'm so excited to have a team, <laughs> my full team. Uh, all, all the members of my team, uh, divisional associate deans uh, and the three new associate deans positions I created as well as the staff in the dean's office, they're tremendous people, creative, uh, intelligent, uh, and really energized uh, to support the work of the college. As you mentioned, I created uh, three new uh, associate dean uh, positions. One associate dean for graduate studies, uh, and Laura Bovilsky is in that role, associate dean for uh, Research and Scholarship, and Jen uh, Pfeiffer from Psychology is in that role, and then one that we've already mentioned, the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Nadia Singh is filling uh, that role. The reason I, I did that is because these were areas that we, the college, clearly needed focused expertise and attention. Uh, and uh, the divisional de uh, deans had been working on it, but they weren't able to give the amount of time and attention that these um, issues uh, need. So it really was a strategic uh, move uh, to make sure that we're advancing in these uh, three um, critical uh, areas. Uh, and you've mentioned that I added three additional positions. I'm very sensitive to administrative and bureaucratic uh, bloat. Uh, so. Uh, Paul, I just want to let you know that in adding those three positions, I've actually slightly reduced the total FTE of deans um, in CAS, and I did that by eliminating one uh, dean position and by reorganizing some of the others. So you, there are also two new associate divisional deans, correct? There are. Can yeah, tell we, us about we have that. two new associate divisional deans, uh, and those are um, Bruce Magoo for social sciences um, and. Um, Elliot Berkman, I had a blank there for a second, uh, Elliot Berkman in Natural Sciences. And Harry Wanham was, uh, uh, still is, was the Associate Dean for Humanities last year and he remains in that position. And you're liking your team? 
Excuse me? You like the team. I, the team is fantastic. <laughs> they're just, they're a lot of fun. We had a retreat uh, two weeks ago, and um, it, was, it was a thrill to spend time with them. So um, let's talk about some of the other things that are happening in CAS. So the School of Global Studies and Languages mm -hmm. was established in 2021. Tell us uh, what's the focus of the school and how's it doing? Yeah. So the School of Global Studies and Languages brings together 100 core faculty uh, from four language and literature departments, uh, five um, area study programs, um, and our Department of Global um, Studies. Uh, one of the focuses of the new school is uh, lang uh, languages. And there are lots of universities that have international affairs programs, but they don't take languages seriously. And GSL is unique because it does. So that's how GSL is uh, uh, unique and um, innovative. Um, uh, GSL also has 22 undergraduate uh, majors and 15 uh, graduate uh, programs. Uh, and the, the uh, faculty uh, and students focus on uh, pressing global issues, including uh, global health, uh, the environment, uh, food systems and sustainability, as well as uh, politics and authoritarianism. You asked how the school is, is doing. Uh, you said the school is established in 2021. It was really launched last fall in 2022 uh, with um, uh, Anish Anish stepping in his role as executive director. Uh, in my view, it's going uh, quite swimmingly. Last year, they uh, graduated 179 undergraduate students. They're on pace to graduate 200 uh, this year. Uh, as we speak, we're moving GSL uh, faculty from their prior homes into Friendly Hall so that they'll have a, a common home. Uh, and, in, and in the summer of 2025, we begin a $73 million renovation project to modernize uh, Friendly. So, so things are going well in GSL, and we're looking forward to the opportunity that it provides our students. So the newest school is the School of mm -hmm. Computer and Data Sciences. That's just opened, I understand. Yeah. That is right. So first of all, tell us about that school and why, why we, had, we needed it. Yeah. Um, well, so the, the school originated from a UO initiative in data science. And that, as part of that initiative, there was a steering committee uh, that met. And they were the one that proposed that a School of Computer and Data Sciences uh, should be uh, formed. Uh, the provost then um, asked um, CAS if we would be the home of that school, and uh, we embraced it. And the reason we embraced it is because uh, our students uh, need to have computational and data literacy. Uh, and so this provides us an opportunity to work that within our uh, curriculum, uh, and we plan um, to do so. Uh, the other reason why uh, the, the school is so important is because there is a huge workforce need uh, in computational and data uh, sciences. Uh, so it's, it's an untapped uh, potential for us to recruit students and to help develop that uh, workforce. Uh, so there are several reasons why we're um, super excited that the school was uh, formed and uh, will be um, housed in um, CAS. Uh, and they're currently uh, looking for an executive director. Um, not sure quite what the timeline is, but we hope to be naming one maybe by the end of this term. Hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, that is certainly timely. There's no question about that. <laughs> um, are there any other initiatives in the works in CS that you'd like to share with us? Well, we have a lot of uh, initiatives uh, that we're uh, currently uh, working on, but I'm not sure there's one that's quite ready for prime time. <laughs> uh, but I'd be willing to come back uh, in a year and, and update you on our progress. I will take that as a problem. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about the way that CAS, College of Arts and Sciences, supports undergraduate research. A good question. Uh, let me start by saying how important undergraduate research is for our students. Uh, not only does it provide them practical training, it exposes them to real life uh, problems, and it also provides them credentials that will help them get their first job or maybe get into to graduate or uh, professional schools. Uh, so super important. Uh, typically our students uh, get exposed to reach research either through the classroom, through independent projects, or through faculty-led uh, research, uh, either faculty uh, funded or grant uh, funded. So the college has been supporting uh, students with financial need that want to work on one of those faculty-led uh, research projects. 
Uh, and we do that through our hands-on uh, learning um, scholarship. Last year we gave away $100,000 uh, to uh, just over uh, 20 um, students. We would love to expand that. Uh, personally, I think every student that wants a research opportunity should have the, the ability to get one. So we're working uh, very actively on increasing that scholarship fund. So um, another thing that's been happening is that the academic advising has been mm -hmm. revamped uh, in Tyson Hall. So tell us about those changes and why those were important. Yeah, so this happened very recently. It happened over the, the summer. Uh, Tyson College and Career Advising uh, was established several years ago. Actually, I'm not quite sure what the, what the date was. Um, but it, it, was con it was conceived as part of strategic planning for the college. It was housed in UESS. Uh, and recently, it's moved from its home in UESS back to CAS. Uh, we think this is really important because we, th uh, we think now that we can focus uh, the advising uh, for CAS um, st students so we can provide them uh, better uh, advising. And of course, academic advising is critical. It's the compass that helps them uh, navigate their career and the opportunities uh, within their college um, experience. Uh, so we're excited at the change. And I just would also mention that our academic advisors are uh, really a fantastic. It's a professional bunch. They um, have so much knowledge of the CAS majors and minors, and they collaborate very closely with uh, the faculty advising that's happening in the departments. Um, why is academic advising important for student success? Why is that, why is that something yeah. we should be doing? I started, um, I alluded to that a little bit. It's, it, it's the, the, the compass that al allows them to get the most out of their college education. Um, it helps them with uh, planning, making sure that they accomplish all the academic requirements, provides early um, career guidance. Uh, so it really is a support, student, uh, support system uh, for students so that they can be successful. Uh, and make the most of the college. And it's especially important for those uh, first generation students that don't have the, the privilege of parents who can help guide them through their college career. Years ago, I was the undergrad director in the English department and I did a lot of academic advising at that point and I was always struck by how few students actually took advantage of mm -hmm. the advising that was offered to them. How is that, how are you, how, how's Tyson meeting that challenge? That's a great question, and I'm not sure I'm um, completely, I'm not the best person to ask that, but we do require uh, first-year students to go to advising, so we, may, we have them make that first contact. We also do a lot of um, communication to those students. So um, I'm going to sw switch some gears now. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit more broadly. So this is a public university. Why are they important? Why do we need them? Great question, and let me just start by saying uh, public universities are uh, essential to the success of this country, and there are a number of reasons why. Uh, first, public universities um, educate an enormous number of students, uh, so they provide accessibility. And the accessibility is both geographic, because they uh, educate the students that are local in that state, and it's also financial accessibility, because public universities uh, uh, typically are um, more affordable than their peer private universities. Public universities are also engines of research and innovation, and they drive both technical and applied uh, advances. Uh, public universities uh, promote uh, and build a, a, a workforce uh, that's needed across the country, uh, including in Oregon. They also drive uh, the local economy uh, and provide uh, jobs. Historically and currently, uh, public universities have been the gem of our educational um, system. Uh, so really can't under, uh, understate their importance. Um, we're just nearing the end of our time, so this will be my last question. So we are at the start of your second year as the Tyson Dean of CAS. Looking back on your first year, have you any particular reflection or memory that you would like to share? Well, my first year was my freshman year. 
And what my first year reminded me of uh, was what it was like to be a freshman. So uh, it was a fire hose. I was learning uh, a lot. Um, I was uh, often stopping students and asking them uh, to tell me how to get to a particular uh, building. But it was a really uh, positive experience. Uh, they're just, they're fantastic people here. Uh, we're doing uh, great things. So as I start my sophomore year, uh, I'm really uh, excited um, to see what we uh, can accomplish. Do you find time to, to talk to the students, to get out there and, and spend time with them? I do a little bit, not as much as I would like, but I make an effort to, to talk to students as much as I can. Well, Chris Paulson, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. We will hope to bring you back uh, to learn more about the progress in CAS. Uh, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Paul. Really appreciate it. I've been speaking with Chris Paulson, the Tyson Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.